Hi, everyone. It's me, Tamara Hedges. I'm the executive director here at UCR Palm Desert. And we are so excited that you could join us here tonight. It's a very special night, one that we've been looking forward to for a very, very long time, featuring my colleague, my friend, and an all around just amazing human being, Todd Goldberg. Oh, I thought you were talking about Maggie. <laughs> Not yet, I'm getting there. Very special night indeed. I wanna thank uh, right off the, the top though, our UCR Palm Desert Center partners. I was looking at the lineup and we have quite a few of our wonderful, generous UCR Palm Desert Center partners. Without you partners, we couldn't do what we do. We wouldn't be here tonight. We wouldn't be able to offer the dozens and dozens of free events that we have been offering since this pandemic began about 17 years ago. So thank you. Well, it seems like it. So thank you for your support, sincerely. Thank you. Um, also at this time, I would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water and air, the Kuwia, the Tongva, the Los Sueño, and the Serrano peoples and all of their ancestors, descendants, past, present, and future. Today, this meeting place is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, including UCR faculty, staff, and students, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. Uh, you might have seen earlier, this event is being recorded, so if um, you miss any part of it, if you have to run out and get a snack, you can always catch up on what you missed. Uh, it'll be on our YouTube page at the UCR Palm Desert Center website. You can find it there. If you have any questions for Todd, and I hope that you do, I hope we have lots of questions for Todd, please use the Q&A feature and throw those in there. There are many people who were vying for this opportunity tonight to interview Todd, and it was a very tough decision. But in the end, after much deliberation, we all agreed there was no one better for the job than Maggie Downs. Maggie is impressive in her own right. She's an award-winning writer and graduate of the UCR Palm Desert Center MFA writing program. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, Palm Springs Life, and McSweeney's. Uh, let's see, and uh, sorry, lost my place here. She is the author of the incredible book, Braver Than You Think. Uh, it's a wonderful read, one of my favorite books of all time. She, she also happens to be our director of marketing and research or outreach and research, lots of research. She did research for, for this event tonight here at the UCR Palm Desert Center. And probably most importantly, she is brave enough to interview Todd Goldberg. So take it away, Maggie. Hi everyone. Um, so our special guest tonight needs no introduction. You all already know he's Time Man of the Year. He's people's sexiest man alive. I mean, you all have the Google. You're here for Todd. You, you, know, who, uh, you know who he is and what he's about. But I'm going to tell you a little bit of background about how I got to know Todd. Um, so there was a party. And it was a movers and shakers party at an art gallery. And Todd was there covering something for the LA Times. And I was there because it's a party. <laughs> and, and we got to talking and he was funny. And he found out that I was a, a reporter for the local newspaper. And then um, when his book, um, Other Resort Cities came out, which is a collection of short stories that came out in 2009, uh, Todd reached out to me and, um, and, and I agreed to read the book and interview him. Um, I was sent a galley of the book and um, it was a misprint. There were blank pages <laughs> inside. So when I interviewed Todd and I had him sign the book, Todd also wrote an original story for me inside the book. And I am going to read that story to Odd. you now. <laughs> and this will tell you everything you need to know about Todd Goldberg. <laughs> A 10 word short story. He shouldn't have kissed his sister on the mouth again. <laughs> <laughs> and
And it's that word again, <laughs> you know, that's doing a lot of work right there. <laughs> so, um, so that gives you a little bit of insight into uh, the brain of Todd Goldberg. And now, of course, we work together at UCR Palm Desert. And, um, you know, pre-pandemic, we would sit in a lot of meetings together and I would look across the table and I would know that Todd was just thinking about setting fire to a mound of corpses. <laughs> And those are the things you can read about in his new book, The Low Desert. That is correct. Thank you, yes. Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> and I should um, note, here's an important thing. So Maggie and I, as many of you know, uh, in normal times, also host a radio show together called Open Book. And we are currently, this is true, nominees inexplicably for a national award for broadcasting. Yeah. As yeah. the best <laughs> hosts in America. So no very pressure. weird. <laughs> no pressure, Maggie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Usually I let Todd do all the heavy lifting. So um, a little a little insight now we would do the show is we wouldn't prepare. Right. And then I'd come in and I'd say, what are we talking about? And Maggie would be like, I don't know, man. It's on you. And then, <laughs> and then our producer would point and then I'd just start talking and hope that Maggie would awaken by the break at the 30 minute mark. <laughs> Todd would usually say, you know what? I'm angry. And then he would <laughs> start talking about something that makes him angry. Um, it's true. So let's, let's talk about uh, your new story collection. Okay. Um, since we are no longer recording the radio show at the moment, I imagine that's where you've channeled a lot of your anger. <laughs> and, <laughs> Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. So first of all, um, you know, you were on track to write the conclusion of uh, the gangster land world. So maybe tell everyone a little bit about like where the story collection came from and why you decided to expand the world in this way. Yeah. So, you know, I'd written um, Gangster Land and Gangster Nation. And in between writing Gangster Land and Gangster Nation, I wrote another book called uh, The House of Secrets, which I wrote with my friend Brad Meltzer. Um, and so over the course of about four and a half years, I wrote three books, all of which were over 400 pages long. And I was pretty tired <laughs> of writing um, the same characters over and over again. Um, but I was you know, I, I knew I was going to write a third novel. I'd already sold the third novel. Um, but then a champagne problem came along, which was that uh, Amazon had optioned Gangster Land and Gangster Nation. And I started working pretty closely with uh, the folks involved with that um, on the adaptation. And it became clear to me as we were working on it that it, was, it would be kind of silly for me to write this third book before I knew whether or not this TV show was actually going to happen. Um, because I wanted to make sure that I was not sort of in a George R. R. Martin position where um, I had a show on the air and no new books to, to write. So I took a little break from writing that novel. You know, I got about 100 pages in when all of this, you know, became more serious. But it also allowed me to, to think, you know, what I want to do really is I want to expand the universe that I've written. I want to look at some characters that I've written about um, maybe just in passing or in shorthand uh, in the previous book. So for those of you who have read Gangster Land and Gangster Nation, um, I wanted to write more about Peaches Pocatillo, who is the main villain of Gangster Nation and is the main villain essentially going forward. I wanted to write the backstory of how Sal Cupertine's father had died. Um, and I wanted to explore the lives of some other minor characters that I had liked writing, but that I had, um, that I had killed. I had, I had popped them in the back of the head or stabbed them repeatedly or cut them up into little pieces. Uh, and so writing these short stories allowed me to expand that universe and also potentially, you know, if, if a TV show happens, provide some secondary storylines for, uh, for the show as well. So it started out that way, like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some stuff that expands that universe. But the more that I wrote uh, and rewrote some old stories, and the more that I talked to my editor, uh, Dan Smetanka, who's accepting um, your manuscripts in the chat, um, the more we realized, like, I really had an opportunity not just to expand the universe, but to connect some stories into a larger sort of criminal world that I've created almost inexplicably over the years and 
and the short stories that I'd already written and the stories I was planning to write right now that all had, you know, a, a line between them. And a lot of times that line is setting, you know, somewhere in the desert Southwest, Palm Springs, Las Vegas, the, the desert between Palm Springs and Las Vegas. And so I really ended up spending, you know, a year and a half writing new stories, rewriting old stories, expanding the universe that I was writing about and trying on some different outfits too for the future. You know, I, I've had a long desire to write about the Salton Sea um, and to write about a character of mine, um, Morris Drew in the Salton Sea, either as a book or a TV show. I, I, I don't know quite which just yet. And this book allowed me to, to explore those things too, to try on different voices and try on different characters. Um, and it was it was a passion project that um, ended up being something I was really really passionate about. I, I loved I loved doing it. I loved um, I loved being able to write new characters again. It's been a really long time since I'd written a new character, and you know, no one you never want to get bored with the thing that you that you love that you created. Mm -hmm. um, I was trying to figure out the timeline exactly because a lot of the characters are really um, grappling with the idea of death. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering um, how, if the pandemic affected that at all um, or added some you know, new shades to these stories. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I turned in the first version of this book in September of uh, 2019. And then I ended up writing three new stories after that point. Um, based on some editorial stuff that, that my editor and I had discussed and some changes that we decided we were going to make. And so I wrote all three of those new stories during the pandemic, um, three or four of them, and then edited old stories during that time too. So there's a story, um, Pilgrims, uh, in the book, which is uh, one of uh, a couple of stories that involve a cocktail waitress that lives in Palm Springs. And I had a originally written a version of it many, many years ago, substantially different that it appeared in a literary magazine called uh, The Rattling Wall. And as I, was, as I was rewriting it, I realized like, oh, I'm, I'm changing the year that it takes place. I'm putting it to present day. And I have her watching TV, the TV news. And there's just a moment where she looks at the news and she asks herself, does she need to be worried about these people dying in China? And you know, that could be any time, really, right? You know, when you're watching the news. Um, but it was, you know, that's me leaking into <laughs> leaking into my prose. Like, do I need to be worried about this? Is this the thing I should be worried about? Um, so yeah, for sure, the, the pandemic played a role. And, you know, my relationship with, with death, I mean, goes, I mean, it's all I've ever written about. <laughs> so, I mean, it's good to know your obsessions early. Um, but I think this story is, or the stories in this book often are about the aftermath of conflict and not so much about um, the fear of death. It's more like the fear of why someone else, or the fear of understanding why someone else died in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, before we forget, I think we should tell everyone that you need to read the stories in order in yes. this collection, because I'm a person who skips around in story collections and I'm very happy I read these in order. So yes. just wanna make that clear. Um, you should, I, and if you don't read them in order, I mean, there's gonna be a, it's gonna be me. Yeah, I'm gonna be like, why'd know. you do that? Yeah. What's wrong with you? Why did you do that? You ruined it. <laughs> um, I've heard a rumor that Sal's dad is still alive. Would you like to comment on that? <laughs> that Sal's dad is not still alive. No. <laughs> <laughs> that is not I, true. <laughs> okay. All right. Just checking. I might've heard that from an editor we share. Um, <laughs> So uh, the very first story in the collection, The Royal Californian, mm -hmm. um, the setting is, um, is very clear for anyone who has ever served jury duty in Indio and walked across the street to uh, the, the bar <laughs> to have lunch. Um, so that, that story was particularly vivid to me. And one of the characters in the story is a clown who might seem familiar to... Um, <laughs> to people in our area. Um, but that brings me to, um, to a game that I've prepared for you, Todd. Oh, I'm prepared. Yeah. I'm ready. Okay. Um, and maybe people in the chat can help you out if you okay. get stuck on any. So this game is called Gangster or Clown. <laughs> so I have a list of names 
real gangsters and real clowns. Okay. You have to tell me which is which. I'm, I'm ready. All right. Sammy Purple. Gangster. Yes. Jack the Hat. Gangster. Yes. Frosty Little. Ooh. Clown. Yes. <laughs> Mad Frankie. Ooh. Clown. Gangster. <laughs> The Wizard of Odds. <laughs> That's a gangster. That is a gangster. Sylvester the Jester. That's a clown. <laughs> no Nose. Uh, no Nose is a gangster. Yes. Slim Pickings. <laughs> That's got to be a clown. Yes. Willie Potatoes. Ooh. Clown. Gangster. Ooh. The Banana Man. Mm -hmm. Gangster. Clown. <laughs> Joey the Clown. Oh, come on now. Gangster. <laughs> How dare you? How dare you? Joey the Clown <laughs> is a character that I ripped off in my Gangsterland book. So Joey the Clown <laughs> is Joey the Clown Lombardo, who, run, who ran the Chicago outfit. And this is important. Um, our dear friend Gina Frangello, who will be here at Arts and Letters in April with... Um, uh, Emily Rapp Black. Uh, he owned a bar called The Four Trays, which appears in my book, Gangster Land. And Gina Frangello's dad ran numbers out of The Four Trays for Joey the Clown Lombardo. Wow. Okay. I only have a few more. Okay. TJ Tatters. Clown. Yes. Pinky Lee. Happy Days character. Clown. <laughs> Pinky Tuscadero. Yeah. Joe Bananas. <laughs> Oh, come on. <laughs> gangster. Oh, okay. My gangster knowledge is not as, <laughs> as uh, expansive as yours. I haven't been a gangster since college. Uh, Pizza Al. Clown. Gangster. Mr. Noodle. Clown. Yes. <laughs> Shaggy Two <too> Dope. <laughs> <laughs> Insane Clown. <laughs> Insane Clown Posse. Yes. Fat Herbie. Gangster. Yes. Bozo the murderer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> we made that up. So um, I wanted to um, ask you about, so this will take a brief story to get to the question, but I think it's a great question. Okay. Um, okay. So just stick with me. I'm here. All right. So Forever, I dated this. Apparently. <laughs> I dated this dude and he was in, he was in a bar when there was a bar fight mm -hmm. and the guy who lost the bar fight left the bar and then came back with a gallon of kerosene, poured it on the guy he had gotten into the fight with and lit him on fire. And my boyfriend told me that's the first rule of bar fights is that you never stay in the bar after the fight is over. Right. And I thought, there are rules to bar fights. Oh, like yeah. how, how do you know the rules? And it turns out he knew the rules because he had been in a lot of bar fights, but I was reading your collection and there are a lot of, um, a lot of rules, mm -hmm. um, a lot of unspoken rules, a lot of the um, like rules in the gangster world or in the cocktail waitress world. Um, can you talk about uh, how you do the research on this and also how you know these things? Well, you know, everyone has a code, you know, it doesn't matter what, what you do for a living or where you were raised, you are bound by some kind of code of conduct. Um, it's like going on a golf course. You don't just walk on a golf course while people are playing Tamara Hedges. Tamara Hedges has a, has a unique skill of walking on golf courses while there's golf going on. So everyone lives by some kind of code. Um, and you know, there's a, a long history in crime fiction of criminals writing down like their like their ten rules for bank robbing and things like that. Most notably, in Elmore Leonard's fantastic book Swag, uh, there's a, a ten rules for um, for being a criminal. One of which is don't consort with criminals, um, which I've always uh, which I've always loved. And you know, for the mob, there's there's a lot of rules that primarily have to do with silence. You know, the you know the code of Omerta suggests that. You know what happens in the family stays in the family we're going to be quiet about everything we're not going to go against the family we're also you know we're not going to involve civilians 
We're not going to kill your wife. We're not going to kill your dog. All these, all these rules that in fact have no bearing on the reality of how they actually do their business. It's a charming notion that isn't true. Um, because if it were true, we wouldn't know about the mafia. But like every horrible secret organization, they're peopled by uh, folks who can't shut up. And so we know about every, we know about the skull and bones because people say, I've been skull and bones. You can't talk about it, which immediately says, oh my God, I know a guy who's in skull and bones. Um, and it's the same for the mafia. Um, but it's, you know, it's also the same when you work in a restaurant, you know, like, oh God, never talk to that person in the break room or else they're going to tell you about their kid. Um, you never pick up a shift for that person because they'll never pick up that shift for you. Don't sleep with the bartender. Don't sleep with the 17 year old that seats people. Like all these, you know, sort of rules that when you work at a restaurant or work in a bar, everyone always ends up violating. And I'm sort of fascinated by these ecosystems and how people perpetrate misdeeds in small closed circles. Um, and so I like to write about that. I like to write about a little world where someone acts outside of it. So for instance, there's a story in the book called uh, Goon Number Four, which is um, about a hitman assassin goon who, um, you know, stops doing his goon work and ends up going back to school at the College of the Desert, for those of you who live in the Coachella Valley, and gets, uh, takes a class in radio journalism at a station called KCOD, where Todd and Maggie host a radio show. And there's all these rules involved with, you know, like how you talk to someone um, and, you know, what, what you would reveal to someone if they asked you a question. And so at an early point in the story, uh, a teacher asks the main character, this goon, what do you do for a living? And he says, I'm a goon, an assassin, private security, you know, whatever the assignment is. And the teacher just laughs and says, oh my God, can you imagine what a life that would be? Because no one wants to believe that someone will break the rules, break the code and say the truth about themselves. It's even as simple as when you see someone and you ask, oh, how are you doing? And they say, oh, I'm doing fine. The pandemic has been great for this. Like people say, how are you doing? And then you find out, you're like, oh my God, I, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so terribly sorry. <laughs> um, so I love that. I love that, that skew towards awkwardness where you break that social convention. I think that's a big part of writing about criminals because criminals are always breaking a core social convention and they're a wild card. You don't, you don't know where they're gonna go with anything that they do. Mm -hmm. um, that's really fascinating. I, I also, um, I was really interested in your process in how you revisited some of these stories. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I went back to um, your old collection and read some of the, the previous versions and, and they were good then, but it's kind of like um, an Instagram filter has been added. You know, it just, it gives you this new depth or um, adds these new contours that, that weren't there before. Um, I'm curious if you think these stories are done or if you think you would revisit any of these in the future. Um. These ones are done. You know, the the reason I was able to go back to these older stories um, is because I didn't even really know I was linking them together at the time when I wrote them. But as I wrote other things, it became clear I was writing about the same universe of people. And so going back to an old story like, um, like Palm Springs, which uh, Carolyn Kellogg, who's in the audience, asked me to write for her literary magazine, hot metal bridge when she was a graduate student a million years ago. Um, you know, I was writing about Las Vegas and Palm Springs at the time. And I was writing about a person who was sort of at the edge of criminality. You know, the people that she knew were kind of shady people. She was involved with some shady business. Um, you know, she, she was a cocktail waitress in casinos, which is always you know, one step away from a crime or a bad scene happening. Like the thing about casinos to me, incidentally, and then I'll answer your question, um, is I've always felt a little unsafe in a casino because there's so much at risk at every single table. There's someone who's about to lose everything. Um, and there's someone who's there because who's there they need to make their rent. Or there's someone who's there who needs enough money to get out of town or whatever it is. And when you're around people like that, you're always around danger. And then you mix in alcohol 
um, and pressure. And it always feels combustible to me. And when I lived in Vegas, you'd see, you'd see fights all the time in the casino, but they would get broken up so quickly because there's so much security in a Vegas casino. That's not the case in a lot of the casinos in, um, in the Coachella Valley where I, you know, I haven't, I don't consort in them very often, but there's the last time I was in one, I saw one of the most violent fights I've ever seen in my entire life in the spa casino. Um, but so, you know, going back and looking at these stories and tying them together, a lot of it was me and Dan talking and saying, okay, Dan being my editor, talking and saying, okay, like this is a story where, that I want to tie more closely into the Gangsterland universe. I want to bring a character in here and, and show, you know, how that person's uh, chaotic life has just been on the fringes of this person's quest for normality. And so we would do that. We would talk about where these people might go. And we, you know, I had to draw a big sort of chart to make sure I had everything lined up correctly. Um, but they're finished now because they're now part of a real continuity. Um, but there's, a, there's one story, um, The Last Good Man, that I've written four times. So the first version of The Last Good Man was, was written in 1996. And it was called Where the Ends Meet. And it was published in uh, Indie Men's Magazine, a men's magazine in Indianapolis. And then uh, I rewrote it for my collection of the resort cities and we called it Granite City. And then I rewrote it again for an anthology of uh, Christmas stories that Soho Press put out and we called it Blue Memories Start Calling. And in that case, I had moved it, you know, I turned it into a Christmas story. Um, and then we rewrote it again to make sure that Morris Drew's life lined up with Morris Drew in the Low Desert and Morris Drew in the Salt, which are two stories in the book. So now finally, he's he makes sense. You know, he's now he's now got a canon. So I'm I'm done with those characters for sure. Um, and it's actually one of the reasons why the um, the short story Mitzvah. Which, it, which was the start of my Gangsterland stories is not in this book because I thought it'd be too confusing because that story was the basis for Gangsterland and, and Gangster Nation, but we changed so much of it that if I put it in the book and you'd read the previous two books, nothing would make sense. Um, so, we, so we left it out. And you know I didn't want to rewrite that story, which is a good story in and of itself and has been um, very good to me uh, in, in general. Um, because it, it was a thing, you know, it was its own thing. These other stories could have been more if, by being tied together, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, I jotted down a few notes of how you uh, describe people. So <laughs> I'm going to read that. Again. He's one of those guys who talks like he's been around the world 50 times. The kind of guy who handled his problems versus having his problems handle him. These are all different guys, by the way. The kind of guy who might have some neck ink. The kind of guy who cut your eyelids off but let you live. The kind of guy who kicked women and pulled out snitches' tongues and pissed on hookers just for fun. So I was wondering, what kind of guy are you? So how would you describe Todd Goldberg wow. in a Todd Goldberg story? So let me just be clear. Do I use the actual sentence construction, the kind of guy for yeah. all those? Yeah, I just did um, a search on the <laughs> on Kindle, Kindle book. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> we got to get a better copy editor. <laughs> no, I liked it though. It's it ties everything together. He's yeah, you know. and you know, it's it's my it's my voice. You know, yeah. that, that's the sort of thing I think the I do. The kind of guy who yeah, the kind that. of guy who exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, I I think I'm generally speaking um, the kind of guy who is empathetic to his friends, is kind and generous, and says things smiling that he means seriously. <laughs> and I think that can be dangerous. Um, I don't know, you know, I, uh, I'm more loyal than any character that I write about. I think that's for sure, you know, um, and I think my characters give themselves more of a break than I give myself sometimes, mm -hmm. um, for my failures or regrets or whatever. You know, my characters tend to right size a problem with a gun, 
I tend to right size a problem with an edible. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a key difference. But you know, the, the one thing that my characters and I share, I think, um, is, you know, we're, we're constantly battling notions of identity. You know, I, I've been writing about identity my entire career and, and didn't really realize it. And, you know, until I was writing an article about my brother, where we were both talking about the things that we do. And I was like, you do this and I do this. And I was like, wait a minute, I do that, shit. Um, and so the sort of search for identity and the understanding that you can be different people in different places, you know, that's that's not so different than the things that I think about myself. You know, um, actually my lovely wife, Wendy and I were talking uh, yesterday about uh, a mutual friend of ours and, um, I said, uh, you know, that person's that person's mean. I said, but I'm I'm mean too. And Wendy said, you're only mean when you choose to be mean. And I was like, oh, that's true. Like I sometimes, as Maggie knows, <laughs> can choose to be mean. Um, it's not the best of me, but it's it's a part of me that I'm aware of. Um, and so I think that's something that happens in my characters. Sometimes they make a choice to be the worst versions of themselves. I think I've managed in the last 15 years or so to keep that part of my life down. <laughs> um, but I also have a lot of violent thoughts about people that I just see on the streets whose masks are under their nose or who litter. <laughs> so yeah, there's that. I think you're right though. I think intentional meanness is, is a different story. Right. Like, yeah. Um, I have one last question and then uh, we'll ask some of the questions from the audience. Oh, also, no. uh, we have a request for you to talk about some vegan cookies. Um, <laughs> no, but, Matthew's a pruder must be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, how has leading a creative writing program changed your own writing? Oh gosh. Well, it, it means I have to be good. You know, it means that every single thing that I write has to be good. And you know, that's not to say that sometimes things that I write aren't better than other things that I write. But if you are standing at, uh, at the top of a pyramid, telling people how to do a thing, and then you're crap, it's not a great example for them to do. Um, and so there's that part of it, like, for my personal life, but the, you know, the, the writing that I do is also influenced by the students that I have. Because when I'm reading my students' work and telling them, you know, hey, this works or this doesn't work, it's not coming from a place of lack of experience. It's coming from a place of these are the problems that I've had in my own life. So when I look at a story or look at a book and say, hey, look, I know what's coming for you. And in 50 pages, this novel is going to fall apart. It's because I've been in that position before. And so I think it also makes me as a writer more selective with the stories that I uh, pursue. Um, so there's that part of it. But emotionally, um, you know, teaching is the most fulfilling thing that I do professionally. Uh, the success of my students, um, even the ones that I don't get to teach like you, um, is the most important thing that, that happens to me. Um, because these folks, including yourself, have put their faith in a philosophy that I have that and that philosophy trickles down to the professors who uh, work with me about what we can do for creative writers and how they can become better writers and become more successful and achieve the things they want to achieve. And if that philosophy is faulty, if my point of view is wrong, I'm not just making a mistake, I'm ruining somebody's life. And so um, I, I spend a lot of time that, I, uh, that maybe a religious person would devote to God um, to the idea of how we teach the craft of creative writing and prepare someone to be a writer. And that's important to me. You know, that's, that's, um, that's the most important thing that I get to do is pay someone back for their faith in me that I, that I know what I'm doing. Um, but also it's the worst thing when, when I believe in someone and they don't believe in themselves and the result is that they can't do the thing that they have more talent in the world to do. And that happens less often than um, than normal. You know, it's a small percentage, but 
I'm more stuck on the students who had the tremendous amount of talent but didn't have the perseverance or didn't have the will or couldn't take the criticism um, than I am oftentimes for the people that were successful because the successful people, like they wanted it. And I just think, oh God, if you just wanted a little bit more, if you could take it, you could get where you wanted to go. And that's the thing that keeps me up at night. Not the, the success of the students doesn't keep me up. It's the, it's the students that I feel like um, I could have helped more, you know, not to be Schindler, but that's, that's the ones that I, that I think about. So how are you um, learning these things about the craft? Is it like, are you secretly watching, you know, master, master classes <laughs> or are you learning from the faculty that's around you? Or is it just learning by doing and failing and, and writing again? All those things, um, you know, reading, reading a ton of stuff constantly, like I'm constantly reading, you know, books or student work or, you know, anyone, you're learning something from reading it. But, you know, from, from my friends and my, uh, my colleagues, you know, I learned more about poetry, uh, sitting and, and talking to Joe Asbaum and Matthew Zapruder drunk in, in a hotel room than I ever learned in college, you know. Um, and reading great work is a great teacher as well. You know, it's like Bruce Springsteen says that he learned more in a three minute song than he ever learned in school. I learned more from reading fantastic work that writers I respect tell me to read than, uh, than I ever learned at Cal State Northridge with my 2.36 GPA. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the, the ability to learn more though is still there. I mean, I just read this great book uh, somewhere on my desk George Saunders' new book, um, where he looks at seven Russian short stories and sort of breaks them apart and talks about how he teaches them. Um, and then we interviewed him on my uh, other podcast, uh, Literary Disco. And talking to George Saunders about how he teaches Russian literature, I was like, well, I got my second MFA. And in this MFA, I learned something. Uh, <laughs> so you're, you're constantly picking up new things. And, you know, I've, I've started doing more screenwriting lately. And the person I leaned on the most to teach me screenwriting are the three screenwriters that work for me uh, or work with me and Bill Rapkin and John Schimmel and Joshua Malkin. Poor Joshua Malkin had to read more drafts of the last screenplay I wrote than the people I wrote it for. Um, but that's because I trust him implicitly to tell me the truth and to, to help me because he's the most astute reader of these things I've ever had. Um, but, you know, here's the thing. You can't be you can't be complacent in your talent. If you start to believe your best, your best critical claim, you're going to suck. Um, I mean, this is a thing that happened a long time ago, and my agent, who's here, can attest to it. After I wrote my second book, uh, *Living Dead Girl*, you know, I'd gotten great reviews and I'd lost lost lots of nice uh, awards <laughs> for it, and I wrote a third novel that, as I was writing it, everyone told me was crap. And the only person that didn't believe them was me. And when I finally sent it to Jenny, my agent, she was like, this isn't it. <laughs> um, even though I, like, I knew she was right, I didn't believe her. And so she sent the book out to some editors that she trusted. And I had a conversation with one of them and he was just like, I'll publish this book, but it's gonna ruin your career and you'll never get back from it. And I was like, oh my God everyone wasn't lying to me. They were right. <laughs> this book is crap. And that was a, it was a shock to my ego because I had believed all of my best critical acclaim. I don't believe any of the critical acclaim now, except for Time Magazine. <laughs> um, so some questions from the audience. Yes, um, Michael Kraft asked, and we touched on this earlier, uh, the pandemic has affected the way we live, work, and think for nearly a year now. Do you think it's had an effect on your process of writing and on the writing itself? Um, so how has it changed your process at this time? Not, not at all. <laughs> you know, I was, um, I was pretty prolific during the pandemic. I have to tell you, I was, I, was, I was super prolific because the fact is I'm not leaving the house and I really like to write. And Wendy bought me a really nice espresso machine and we have food here and you know, like, it's the perfect setup for me to get the writing done. Now, of course, just like anybody else, when the pandemic first hit, I was a, I was a mess. You know, from in the beginning of March till the early part of April, I couldn't do anything. But when I realized, like, oh, I got to finish this book, 
I sat down and I said, I'm not going to watch the news. I'm going to click in and, and, and that's it. I'm going to do my work. And I was super prolific. And I stayed that way essentially over the entire course of the summer as I was working on some screenplay stuff and some essays and things like that. And then the only time I stopped really being um, creatively prolific was basically October to November 3rd. <laughs> and just like everybody else, like, oh, I want to be present if American democracy is collapsing. Like, I should, I should watch that. <laughs> so it hasn't changed the way I write. Um, but the fear and the anxiety that I feel around me um, and that I know my friends and family are dealing with, um, that for sure plays a role in how I write things. Because, you know, it's hard, it's hard to try to convey what all of us feel because all of us are feeling it. So I wouldn't attempt to write some great book about the pandemic. I did write an essay early on um, about a weird thing that happened in the early days of the pandemic where uh, my next door neighbor um, had Alzheimer's wandered into my house. Um, I wrote about that and you know that was the, the hardest thing that I wrote this entire time because it was also about my fear and my isolation. Um, but I'm, I'm able to compartmentalize uh, pretty well mm -hmm. to write. I have to say that is not the experience for people who have their kids at home right now all the time. I'm sorry about that. Maggie. Yeah. Um, so Gina Frangello says she has her Lake Forest College fiction writing class here to watch your events. Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, what advice would you give to undergraduate writers who are just beginning their lives as writers? Don't hook up with someone in the workshop. You will not get good feedback from them. Let's just be clear. That's just, that's the most important thing. Do, I see you guys, don't hook up. This is important. Um, the second thing is take this time to experiment, you know, do weird things, write weird stuff. You're not going to sell your book out of your, uh, out of your undergraduate workshop in college. So take this time to try on as many skins and outfits as you can while you're writing and get great feedback and advice from a writer like Gina Frangello um, who has written great fiction and nonfiction and can tell you what the one great line is in, in your story. Um, you know, as an undergraduate in, in my creative writing classes, I remember them well. Um, you know, I was so filled with my own ego that I couldn't listen to criticism from my classmates. I could only hear it from the professor until one day the professor, a wonderful guy named Jack Lopez said, you know, Todd, you're not the only non-moron in this class. <laughs> like it, was a, it was a good moment when he said that to me. He wrote a great book called uh, Cellos and Surfers. He's a good dude. Um, so, you know, listen, listen critically to your classmates, read widely. Don't be afraid of, you know, of aping whatever favorite writer that you are reading. You know, everyone reads an Amy Bender short story and decides they're going to write a story about a bunch of potatoes that live on the moon. Like, feel free to do that. <laughs> that thing. It's fine. You're in college. You're supposed to experiment and poorly model your heroes. <laughs> um, Lynn uh, would like to know, how do you decide on the geographies of the stories? That's a good question. Um, and I appreciate you asking it. No one's ever asked me that story. Setting is really important to me. Um, you know, I, I come from a point of view uh, that the great writer Josip Novakovic elucidated uh, that setting begets character, begets plot. So out of a place comes a person, out of a person comes a story. And so I really like to write about people in unusual places because you don't know how they'll react in a, uh, in a different place. So there's a story in the book um, called uh, Ragtown, um, which I won't give too much of the plot away because it's, uh, it's a good story. But I was looking for a really out of the way old place with a cool name where I could set a scene in a short story. And I came across the whole mining district that exists outside of the uh, Mojave Preserve. And all of these towns in, in this old mining district have these great names and they're all names of other cities across the world like Baghdad and Siberia and all these places that are, you know, that how they decided on those names for these places is absurd because it's just a, it's the scariest desert you've ever been in. Um, and so I was like, oh man, I want to, I want to write about someone who's there. You know, I want to, I want to go to that place. But I also think about, you know, a, 
a bar in a skeezy hotel. Like who decides that's the bar they're going to drink in? And who decides when they walk in that bar and they see a clown that they're still going to drink in that bar? Um, all of those things play a role in how I write things. Because when I get stuck, and this is something I tell my students all the time, if I get stuck, I, I change the scenery. I take a character out of one place and I stick them in another and I make them have a conversation with someone. And invariably writing about that conversation will get me to the plot point that I want to have. Um, and so setting is the conduit for conflict for people all the time. I mean, look, I'm, I'm not an angel. I'm just gonna let you guys know that. Sometimes I go into Starbucks and they write Ted on the side of my cup and I lose it. I lose it. And so if I lose it and I'm also a hitman, what is that like? What is that like for that character? So for me, I'm like, do I look like a Ted? So I'm a Ted to you? Um, or the other day I was being interviewed and a guy asked me, how do you come up with the MacGuffins? And I actually said in the middle of this interview, I look like a guy who writes fucking MacGuffins. You think I write fucking MacGuffins? So that was a good interview. Um, <laughs> but it had the effect of changing the setting between the two of us. <laughs> um, so setting um, oftentimes is predicated on the kind of story that I'm telling and what a change in setting will do for the central conflict of a story. Mm -hmm. It's funny that you say it's the scariest desert you've ever been in because that's, those are the places where I go to find comfort. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I just... <laughs> it's also beautiful. I mean, it it's, it's gorgeous out there. But it, you know, it's where the, the German tourists go to die because they bring one ball of water with them. Yeah, it's true. Uh, Dinah Lenny says, for both of us, is there a book you go back to again and again? And what are you reading now? And also, what are you watching on TV? Is there a book I go back to? Yeah, I mean, the book I go back to over and over again is um, is Out of Sight by Elmore Leonard. That's my That's my Bible. Um, if you've only ever seen the movie, that's fine, because the movie's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. One of my favorite movies of all time. Um, but what that book does is everything I've ever wanted to do as a crime writer. You know, you're given a main character, a bank robber that you should abhor. And you're given a FBI agent or U.S. Marshal uh, that you should be rooting for to catch the bank robber. And then when they meet, all you want them to do is to fall in love. And that runs counter to everything you've ever read in any crime novel ever. And particularly because the US Marshal is a woman. Um, it's funny, it's sad, it's weird, it's violent. Um, and there's a surprise on every single page. And Elmore Leonard, you know, he's, he's like a god to me in general, but he wrote that book when he was in his late sixties and it was the best thing he'd ever done. And so that book always, you know, is a, is a place I'd like to go back to uh, just to see how he constructs scenes over and over again. Uh, in terms of TV I'm watching, um, well, I reached the end of Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu. <laughs> <recently. laughs> um, the last great thing that I watched, I've been watching a lot of these crime documentaries. The Night Stalker documentary on Netflix was amazing. Absolutely loved that. And the same guy, uh, Tiller Russell, uh, did another documentary called The Last Narc, which is about the murder of the DEA agent in Mexico in the 1980s, which is absolutely shockingly amazing. Um, and then he also did another documentary, which I just watched, called Operation Odessa, about these gangsters that tried to buy a sub from the Russians for a cartel in Colombia. And it is bananas, absolutely bananas. Um, and eventually, I'm sure I'll get back to scripted television. But I, I literally have, have watched it all. I've seen every single thing except Bridgerton. Maybe I should watch Bridgerton. I haven't watched that yet. Watch um, <laughs> as far as a book that I go back to again and again, lately for me, it's been um, well, lately, meaning the past few years. Uh, Department of Speculation. Oh, the, I love that book. It's so good. And I know okay. everyone loves weather, but I think Department of Speculation, like every word is so precise and matters. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm reading now is a beautiful collection of essays called World of Wonders. And it's all these tiny, beautiful essays about um, 
interesting things in nature and um, and they're just really exquisite. And what I'm watching on TV, uh, Gail Brandeis had a great uh, essay in The Guardian about um, the show Alone. Well, and, um, and so, and it's, it's this crazy reality show from the History Channel where a bunch of people are sent off to the middle of nowhere and they have to survive by themselves. Are they um, nude? No, oh. no, it's not naked and afraid. Um, It'd be better okay. if they were nude. <laughs> it's, it's a really interesting show. Um, it's also kind of horrifying to see what people turn into after all this time alone. Um, John Husser would like to know what was your research on real local gangsters and bad guys in the Coachella Valley? Oh, that was easy. My mom was sleeping with them. <laughs> So wait, I have to say my original idea for the game that we would play tonight was gangster or person your mom dated. Yeah, well, I... <laughs> <laughs> it's all pretty close. I mean, look, when I was growing up here, there were, you know, from Palm Springs to Marantia Mirage, there was like 15 Italian restaurants that were owned by Banano Capos like Bobby Milano's and, you know, and Paul D'Amico's and all these places were all owned by New York crime families who were wintering in the desert. Um, and then I was going to high school with the sons and grandsons of all of these crime bosses. You know, I, I won't say his name, but like, you know, a guy that, that Greg and I know well, Greg Anderson is in the audience, like, <laughs> All the, like his dad and all his uncles were the the capos of the LA crime families and they were in Palm Springs because Palm Springs is an open city so they wouldn't get shot in Palm Springs they could they could just drive from Palm Springs to LA do their crimes and come back and no one was going to kill them in Palm Springs so you know these things were just like it was just part of living in the desert when you were a kid um so, you know, my research for, for a lot of that stuff was firsthand. In fact, there was, um, when I was a kid, uh, for those of you who live in Palm Springs, uh, for a couple of years, my mom and I, um, it was just the two of us, and we owned a condo at Saddle Rock Gardens, which is a condo complex across the street from uh, Smoke Tree Village. And there was two gangsters that lived on either side of the complex. One guy was a Bonanno crime family foot soldier, and the other guy was a Chicago outfit foot soldier. And they would go and sit out by the pool. And the guy from Chicago, who lived on the left-hand side, his entire torso was filled with bullet hole scars. Like from chest to, that's correct, Greg. Uh, I, see, I see what Greg is talking about. Um, uh, from chest to hip, bullet hole scars. And I would just come out there and I just look at this dude. It's like, the guy looks like, like Swiss cheese. Immediately my mom gravitated to that guy and they dated for like a year and a half. And he had a house in Mexico that we'd go to. Um, so like, these are, these are just dudes that were hanging around. It was really strange. <laughs> um, any details on the TV show with Amazon? Is it moving forward? There's nothing I can tell you legally. Okay, what crimes have you committed? <laughs> What crimes have I committed? Yes. The people want to know, Todd. Well, I mean, there's the obvious ones. Murder. Murder. <laughs> Lying to a priest. Um, like the most recent crime I committed. Hmm. It's a tough one. I'm a big candy stealer from like in the normal times, you know, like when you go to Sprouts and you take the thing and you get all the peanut butter and chocolate things and you dump them in a bag and there's, there's one left and you just, you just nah, I'm just gonna eat that. That's, that's not really a crime. It's a crime, it's stealing. No. Uh, there's the speeding, uh, impersonating an FBI agent. <laughs> <laughs> that one's not a crime either. <laughs> I do it all the time. <laughs> Impersonating a Secret Service agent with you when we protected President Clinton. <laughs> that is true. That is actually a true story. Um, what happened to the Sultan Sea between the 50s and now? <laughs> we might not have enough yeah, time for that one. <laughs> we don't have we don't have enough time for that. But what I will what I will say to you about the Sultan Sea and about why I have chosen to write about it in the Low Desert, the title story, um, and specifically why I'm interested in it, is that the Sultan Sea 
outside of the the flooding of it in 1905, which was intentional, they call it an accident, but it was intentional, is that the Salton Sea has been a grift since the 1800s. There have been people who have wanted to rewild the Salton Sea since the 1800s um, to make money. But the actual building of the Salton Sea city and the infrastructure and the land and all of that that was happening in the Salton Sea in the 1950s and 1960s, a lot of it was, was done by the mob knowing full well that they were never going to, to actually inhabit that place. Um, and of course, there's the, the famous story of the local Palm Springs builder known as Mr. Palm Springs, whose name all of a sudden has escaped me. Um, oh God, this is embarrassing, but I'm on live television, what am I gonna do? Uh, but he was a, a local builder named, who called himself Mr. Palm Springs. And um, he was a Chicago gangster. And he ripped off everybody at the Salton Sea over the course of several years and never left Palm Springs during that time because he didn't want to get killed. Uh, and then he went back to Evanston, Evanston, Illinois to bury his mom and they blew up his house around him afterwards um, with him in it. Um, and that is part of the, the fallout of the grift that was the building of the Salton Sea. So like I did in Gangster Land and Gangster Nation in, in the third book, uh, Death of a Gangster, I want to tell a true adjacent story. Um, you know, I want to write a fictional story that is adjacent to the truth, talk about things that kind of happened or things that I'm interested, um, but put my own spin on it. Um, because Gangster Land has characters and situations that are based on truth. Um, you know, in, in Vegas in the late 1990s, in the early 2000s, the mob, the government, the strip clubs, all of those things were working in concert together in a, a big sting operation that brought down a bunch of people. There was a bunch of strip clubs in the area um, that were owned by the mob and finally found themselves in legal trouble um, because they started beating up civilians and paralyzing them and things like that. And those people started to sue because they weren't scared of the mob. Um, so all these things sort of float around outside of my book and I use some of it to inspire the work that I do. And I wanna do that in, um, in the Salt and Sea stories as well. I think you do such a brilliant job of um, of showing both um, like the, the beauty of the place, um, because it does have a certain beauty, but it's also just such a, a desperate place. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I love the Salton Sea. I think it's it's so eerie, but it's also exquisite. Um, best tip or on on giving honest critique to young writers while still encouraging their enthusiasm and fostering their creative spirit. Oh gosh, I'm not allowed to work with young writers. <laughs> they stopped letting me teach undergrads years ago. Um, you know, I, I think praising, praising originality, even if the sentences are bad, you know, if the idea is good, if the plot is good, even if the execution on a sentence by sentence level is not great. You want to find the, the fantastic part of their mind that they're putting on the page. You know, the thing with a young writer is that their ambitions have not yet met their talent. Um, and this is true of writers at, you know, a lot of different ages, frankly, but, you know, talking about a 15, 16, 17 year old, they might have these grand ideas in their head and they can really see it, but their ability to actually put that onto the page is impossible. They just don't have, they don't have the language or the experience to do it yet. And so I think you have to praise them for the originality of thought, if not the originality or the quality of the writing itself. How would you say pursuing an MFA in creative writing affected you or your students as writers? Is it always worth going back to school? Um, well, I'm, you know, when I got my MFA, it was sort of a special situation, which is that, um, I had already published six books at the time, and I had been hired to start an MFA program, <laughs> and I didn't have an MFA yet. And so I went and got my MFA because I needed to have an MFA to have the job that I have. Um, and in fact, that's not so different than what a lot of folks, or not a lot of folks, but some folks that come to our MFA program are looking for. They want to be professors. They've had a career as a writer. They are transitioning into being writers and teachers, and they need that degree to, um, to do the, the job that they want. For those people like myself, the ability to actually realize that there's more for you to learn 
from the people that um, are there for you and that even though you might be an equal in there in your career with that person, they still have something of value to give to you. Um, that was a lesson that it took me a long time to learn, frankly, um, when I was getting my MFA. But when you have a great teacher, uh, and in my case, that teacher was a writer named Lynn Sharon Schwartz, um, it means all the difference in the world. You know, when, when someone also wants the challenge of, of breaking a, a horse, <laughs> um, it, it means a great deal. Um, and so for me, you know, absolutely going to graduate school was great because I became a far better writer because of Lynn Sharon Schwartz. She taught me how to be an adult writer and not the writer that I was basically stuck in from age 30 to 38 or so. Um, is it always worth it? No, it is not always worth it. Um, you can always read books and write on your own. Now, I know this is not a great recruitment tool, me being honest with you, um, but this is how I sleep at night, by telling the truth. <laughs> um, you know, there's plenty of places where you can go and take classes. You can take classes at UCLA Extension or the New School or Grub Street or any of those places like that that are significantly less expensive. What an MFA program does, though, and forces you to do is it gives you time and intensity of time. Um, it says, okay, for the next two years, I'm going to focus solely on myself. What I do and, and how I spend my creative and critical time is going to be about me and getting me to the place where I can achieve my dreams. Um, and I think we so rarely give ourselves that opportunity to focus on ourselves. All of us, you know, if you, if you have someone else that you love, you're sharing a lot of yourself with that person, right? Um, but to at least focus your creative energies just on you, man, that is so important. It's such a gift to be able to do that. Now, that being said, you also have to find a place that respects what you do. And, um, you know, as a person who writes genre fiction, where I went to school, frankly, did not respect what I do. <laughs> um, and so when I started this program, I made it sure that no matter what genre you write in, no matter what it is you want to do, if you want to write erotica that takes place on Mars with hand puppets, well, you're going to write the best erotica that takes place on Mars with hand puppets that we can get you to. You know, we're going to get you there. We're going to support whatever it is you want to do, irrespective of our preconceived notions of what genre means. Um, and that's been successful for us. And it's successful for the kinds of students that end up coming to the MFA program. But, you know, Steinbeck didn't get an MFA. <laughs> you know, you, you don't need one. You have, to, you, don't, you have to want one for something specific. You have to know that you want it for a thing that you can't do on your own. And maybe that's the time, maybe it's the dedication, maybe it's the perseverance, maybe it's the connections. Um, maybe it's just finding people who share an affinity with you. You know, people that are on the same medication both literally and figuratively um, is sort of nice to find in, in any setting where you find people that do what you're into. Um, I want to be mindful of everyone's time. So I'm just going to ask you two more quick questions. And also John Husser says, you might be thinking of Ray Ryan. Yeah, yeah, Ray Ryan. Um, yeah. uh, is the whole body in the trunk of the car thing different in the desert? <laughs> yeah, because the smell is immediate. Yeah, you can't you can't put someone in the trunk of a car in the desert because like you just park in front of Vons to get some duct tape and you know a little like a length of wire and the fluids are just dumping out of it. Yeah, great question. Yeah, um, <laughs> have you ever been approached by mobsters after they read your books and what have their reactions been? So I've <laughs> I've had some experiences specifically in Las Vegas that have been a little unsettling. <laughs> so. The last time I was in Vegas, um, actually I was there with Emily Rankin, uh, who's in the audience somewhere out there. Uh, I was doing a book signing at the Mob Museum, which is a fantastic museum um, in downtown Las Vegas. And I was signing books and I was having a great time. And a guy walks up to me and he says, I heard you on NPR yesterday. And I was like, oh yeah, yeah I was at NPR yesterday. He's like, yeah, I was driving my kid to school. And uh, the way you talk, like you, you talk like how we talk, like you think how we think. And I was like, I got to meet that guy. And I was like, who's the we that I speak like? And I was like, oh, yeah, okay. He's like, yeah, like, you know, the way you talked about the book, the way you talk about the families, the way you talk about the things that we do, man, I just really appreciate it. They really gave respect to it. So I, I decided you pay respect to him, pay respect to you. I'm gonna come down here, I'm gonna get your book. 
And I'm like, who can I make it out to? He's like, well, just put Tommy D on it. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm just going to put Tommy D on it. And I handed it to him. He's like, thank you very much. I appreciate you. Keep it up. And walked out the door. And I was like, I'm going to get killed. <laughs> These people are going to kill me. Um, but, you know, in, uh, in Vegas, you know, just living there, I like there were dudes that you knew. Guy, like I used to go to the gym inexplicably and there was just like guys you knew. <laughs> um, and so I've heard from people, I've heard via email from people, from ex-gangsters. After Gangster Nation came out, I heard from a lot of um, guys who'd apparently been in prison and were like, man, you got the Gangster 2-6 from Chicago down really well. Like you really understood them, you know, here's a picture of me. And it's just these guys with tattoos on their face. I'm like, why are you writing me? And do I need to be concerned? The best thing though that has happened recently um, is I heard from these folks that run the, uh, the Outlawed Museum, which is a private museum in Los Angeles. And they sent me these great books of uh, motorcycle gangs in and around Los Angeles. And when, we're, when I'm free again, I get to go to the Outlaw Museum and, and look through all their records and stuff. And it's just all these old, California gangsters in and around the Inland Empire that were in motorcycle gangs. And I am, I am absolutely 100% with it. I cannot wait. Um, when they meet me though, and find out that I'm, you know, David Schwimmer without a, without a sweater vest, I don't know how they're going to feel, but totally into it. <laughs> All right. Well, that wraps things up tonight. Uh, everyone, thank you for coming. Feel free to join us tomorrow night for our centers, uh, Center for Ideas and Society event um, when we will be talking about African politics. Oh, yeah. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it.